comedian has a very specific job. He or she are truth bomb throwers. This is Kelly Carlin. She's a thinker, she's a writer, a talker, and a doodler. Now, if you recognize that last name, Carlin, Carlin, where do you know that from? Yes, she is the daughter of the infamous comedian, George Carlin. Would you welcome, please, George Carlin. While she's a, a practitioner of Zen Buddhism and has a master's degree in Jungian psychology better than anyone else, she can talk to what it's like to grow up with a famous father and have to work to step out from behind their shadow. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this fucking place. It's a big club and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. Yeah, that's the value exchange. As soon as they stop making you laugh, yeah, that's their job. Their job is not to fix it. Their job is not to help you fix it. Their job is not to fix the world. They're not politicians. They're not policy writers. They're not psychologists. They're not any of those other things. They are observers of life with a very critical eye. They have full permission to be honest as long as they're making you laugh. So Kelly, you are the daughter of George Carlin, who people keep saying is like the Mount Rushmore of comedians. But I think the term that I've heard you say, a counter-cultural god. A comedian <laughs> who was so counter-cultural that some people, I mean, a lot of people hated him, but some people just were so enamored with him. And today, more than ever, the comedy of 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago is still as relevant today as it's ever been. Why is that? Because we are humans. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we only learn so much of the lesson, you know, everything he talked about, you know, was pertinent to the moment, but it is, you know, I think what he always pointed out was underneath it all, these are the creatures that we are, and this is what runs us internally. I mean, he never talked about it that way, but, and I think the biggest, you know, when he talked about the big issues and why they're still relevant today is because he saw what we were doing 40, 30, 20, 10, or not 10, 15 years ago. And he saw that as humans, we've got this one part of us that's great at connecting and being together and sharing those moments. But the other part of us is uh, greedy and run by kind of the more primal parts of our brain that want more and more. And in America, I mean, he really commented mostly on American culture. In America, this is a consumeristic society. So you know, he saw that as long as that force, those forces of profit, um, you know, selfish profit are set up in our culture, we're going to just keep doing the same things over and over again. And uh, and he was one of those people that was willing to say it out loud when we all, you know, we all knew it and we'd all go, oh, he's right, he's right about that. Yeah, I'm glad he said it because yeah, we're going to be fine. Really I, uncomfortable. Yeah, I gotta, I got to go back and make some more money to buy my new Lexus. I'll be back later, you know. So it's a good um, thing I can afford those front for those front row tickets. Yes, I mean? exactly, exactly. I, I can't wait to dig into your art form and your story. But before we do, you know, one of my favorite comedians is Jimmy Carr, British comedian, uh, one liner, like just one liner after one liner after one liner. This book, I've been talking about yeah. it for a year. Mm. This is one of the greatest books ever written. Uh, it's like mm. a mindset book, but in his introduction, he breaks down comedy. And he goes through a few things. And, and I'll go straight to the fourth one, which is a superpower he feels all comedians have. And he says, comedians have a superpower when it comes to honesty. It's no lie. They're brutally honest, which is refreshing, he says. But he says they can look at the world and they're bemused by how crazy life is. Like, isn't it so weird that all of these things happen and we just all ignore it? Or isn't it so weird that this system takes place and no one is saying anything or talking about it. And so when I think of the courage for someone like me or someone in business or for us to do the things that we need to do, it feels like we need so much courage. And yet, we can look at like comedians, which is why I love to analyze them, who are up on stage, seeing these pattern recognitions, calling bullshit on the things that are bullshit, saying the things that we're all way too afraid or uncomfortable to say, all in the effort to frankly just get us to laugh. I mean, like, what a perfect um, laboratory to, to be able to learn some of the things that we can all learn to be bolder creatives or, or stronger entrepreneurs or run better businesses or better parents or leaders or in relationships or what have you. Growing up with your dad the way that you did, 
Was that brutal honesty kind of something that was there or was that just safe for the stage? Ah, oh, such a good question, Mark. Uh, I would say that it was definitely compartmentalized in our family, definitely for the stage. But my family was dealt with pretty early on from the beginning, uh, addiction and alcoholism in my family. Um, and my mom was a drinker and then it became out of control a few years after I was born. And so my dad, and I was an only child, my dad had to manage a lot of that. And he too came from a family like that. He didn't really have a father. Our family was actually a very typical family dealing with addiction, which was uh, we walked on eggshells around each other. We did not speak the truth or we tried to, and it was always met because when you have an addict, and both my parents were addicts when I was growing up, but my mom was much more out of control because of the alcohol aspect. And my dad could really, he was very high functioning. Obviously my dad was. Um, and whereas it almost killed my mother. So we, we had, we had trouble with truth in our family. And that was something that I learned, unfortunately, as a habit in my own life, which was my dad would ask me things like, how are you? Uh, in my teenage years, and I was not okay, but I would say I'm fine. And he would say great. And we would just keep passing in the hallway. Because denial is so much easier than really having to unpack that emotional stuff. And for my dad, emotional intimacy was really, really hard for him. He fully admitted that he was a person who lived from the neck up. He was a head guy. He was a mental guy, you know, so he could, he could be bold on a stage and cross those lines, those edges that he would talk about, you know, and speak truth to our collective unconsciousness around things. But when it came to the family dynamics, it was much more hard for, for him. And he did his best with all of that. And so it's really, uh, you know, and it was a big reason why I did my solo show and wrote my memoir, Carlin Home Companion. And then Judd Apatow, who directed the documentary, um, George Carlin's American Dream, I think why he leaned so much into our family story is because of the dichotomy of this and that you may have courage in one area of your life and you might not have courage in another area. And I really feel for me personally, my personal growth work in the world is always about facing up to where I'm not bringing my courage, you know, so whether it's to an, moving out into the world as an artist or as entrepreneur, or in my personal relationships or with myself, you know, honesty is terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it like, aren't you don't yes. you feel super vulnerable all the time? But yes, is, it, is it okay? Should, should we all be striving to be the, like, if, if we took your dad, for example, should we be striving to be the same person on stage as, I mean, it would, it would be tiring to be it the same be, person on stage as, as in relationships, as, as the coffee shop and what have you. So is it okay that, that you're, you're showing up in different parts of your life differently? I, I think we have to. I think it's really, really okay. I think if we're so compartmentalized, we're like two different people or three different people are really like hiding most of ourselves. That's really uncomfortable. But a comedian has a very specific job. He's a, he or she are truth bomb throwers. That's their job. Their job is not to fix it. Their job is not to help you fix it. Their job is not to fix the world. They're not politicians. They're not policy writers. They're not psychologists. They're not any of those other things. They are observers of life with a very critical eye. They have full permission to be honest as long as they're making you laugh. Yeah, that's, that's the value exchange, eh? Like if, as soon as they stop making you laugh, mm, yeah. they don't really have much... <laughs> Well, and this is the tricky thing about this these days because of this thing called what what the what the culture is calling cancel culture is that some people in the audience don't think certain topics or perspectives are funny anymore. The thing I love about Jimmy Carr is I'm a huge fan also 
is that at the beginning of his special or his set, he'll say, I will offend you. Just know that you most likely will be offended. It is not personal. This is just what I do. And if you can't handle it, take care of yourself and leave. But I'm not going to (laughs) change. He tells tells this great story where someone, a, a reporter took a transcription of his stage act, took a quote out of context, put it in the newspaper, and then someone read the newspaper about children with disabilities. A father read that to his like seven or eight year old in a wheelchair and she got offended. And then he wrote in an article saying, my daughter was offended by this joke. (laughs) And Jimmy Carr's like, first of all, your daughter shouldn't be hearing this joke. Your daughter shouldn't be in the club. It was taken out of context. Nothing is funny. And what kind of father are you to do this anyway? And I really do think that one of the highest levels of emotional intelligence is being able to laugh at ourselves. Mm. Is really to look at our shadow, like the, the, the most ridiculous, ugliest, neediest, most immature, ass, unconscious parts of ourselves. And when we're able to laugh at that, then I really believe we're being truthful, honest with ourselves. And we're also being completely compassionate because we're not beating ourselves up. We're not we're not calling ourselves, you know, pieces of shit because of that, right? And I so I think that's the highest form of enlightenment is to be able to laugh at ourselves. Is that even, because you had to crush the ego in order to do so or like No, I think the ego has to include it. It's when the ego goes, "Oh yeah, I'm this great person and I do all this great work and da 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 and I still get separation anxiety when I have to pack to go on a trip you know I still get I still feel like I'm three years old like whatever the thing is like you know instead of beating ourselves up right one of the things we do you know pretty well is we find ways to beat ourselves up and I think when we have the courage to laugh at ourselves either personally or as a culture or when a comedian hands us you know, something of a a thought that is racist or a thought that is, you know, ugly or some kind. And they say it out loud and we, (laughs) oh my God. (laughs) It's because, you know, you're never going to squash all these parts of us. It's like, yeah, some part of my brain is hardwired to see everyone as other. And it's screwed and it's ridiculous and I have to rise above that constantly in order to live in a multicultural, diverse uh, household or neighborhood or world. But some part of my lizard brain is like, oh, you're not a lizard? You know, you're the enemy. (laughs) And so it's like, I have to know that, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's, you know, it's taught to us, obviously, through culture, very much so, like 90% of it. But there's also some part of us that's always like on alert, like, you know, are you a lizard? I'm a lizard. Are you a lizard? I'm a lizard. Are you a lizard? I'm a lizard. And so, I, you know, I think you have to laugh at ourselves about all of these things and own it and be, let's be honest with ourselves, you know? So, yeah. One of, one of my greatest joys is making my wife laugh and then having her realize she's laughing at something so inappropriate that she corrects herself. Because, yes. Because it's like, aha! I got you. I got you for a second to laugh at something that you know you shouldn't be laughing at. And yet you laughed anyway, because you just can't help yourself. (laughs) You know, I I think it's so important to be able to... Like, if we don't have a release valve for laughing at things that we don't think we should be laughing at, I don't think culture works very well, you know? And... It's like, look, I'm not a huge fan of the Three Stooges, but men usually I are. I don't get them. I don't, yeah, I don't know if it's an age thing. Like I tried to I, watch them growing up. I grew up with like the original Get Smart and like that kind of stuff. But uh, I love Lucy from the 50s. Love it. But I don't get the yeah, Three Stooges at all. I don't get the Three Stooges either. But I also get that it's really funny. I get the humor. I get what it is. And there's something about that that it's like, you know, because some part of me goes, well, this is not funny. He's always whacking him and making him the victim and he's the perpetrator and this isn't funny. And yet 
it's like even that it's like well i'm taking myself way too seriously in that moment <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit uh in one of your bios you, you talk about you talk about this line this idea of finding your voice and I, I have to imagine if i project myself onto people who meet you for the first time they either are really interested in you or they're like this woman's only somebody because her dad was someone famous and that seems like a terrible burden to, 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 to have to carry. I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow was ripped apart a few weeks ago or months ago because she made this comment out of context that if you have parents who have done something in the industry, she felt you have to work twice as hard because one, the parents might get you into the door, but they won't keep you there. Like you have to, con- like you have to constantly fight against the fact that everyone thinks you're only there because of your last name or because of your connections or because of whatever. Did you kind of have to fight that as you were finding your own voice? Yeah, I think I avoided the conversation a lot or even avoided the industry a lot because of that. I stayed in production and behind the scenes for the most part. And I grew up around a lot of kids of famous people and some of them stepped into the limelight and others didn't. Um, but, But yeah, I mean, this industry is run on relationships as most industries are. (laughs) Yeah, no one wants to admit that, do they? (laughs) Uh, If my dad was a really, really important, successful rug maker and seller, you know, it would have been easy for, you know, easier for me to get into the business and probably flow right in because those things are usually seen as family businesses, things like that, because that's the way it always was for millennia, right? You know, you were in the family business. But the industry, I think because of the fame and the celebrity part of it, which really uh, complicates things, they don't see you as a person who might have a natural skill set. And yes, things are based on relationships. And so, of course, the doors open easier for you, um, for the most part. But immediately, in this industry, because it's so competitive, if you don't have the goods, you're not going to hang around. You're just not going to stick around because you're not doing your job. Uh, production is a, an extremely intense, you know, m- the money is always ticking. Everyone has to show up in their complete A game. And if you're not, then you're dragging the whole thing down. Production is a very collaborative art form. So, if you can't work collaboratively with people and do your job, then you're not going to be hired again. As far as acting and things like that, sure, you might get a you might get a chance to get into something or someone might give you a chance, but you're only as good as your last thing that you did. And, you know, people aren't going to hire you once again if you can't do your job as an actor or a performer. And so I I was always I always felt the that in the room in some ways. And when people would open doors for me or want to have meetings with me and say, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? I was so insecure in my 20s when most of those kind of things happen, right? It's when you start your career and stuff. And I was very distracted by a crazy marriage and some drug addiction and all that kind of stuff that I never felt like I had the goods in order to to walk through that door. Um, So it was, it was, it, you know, it was, the, I was kind of the opposite person. I, I did not feel like I ever could meet the standards. So I just shied away from all of that and stayed invisible. How did and you overcome that? My mother died when I was 34. And it was a huge shock to our family. She was fine. And then she wasn't feeling very well. And then she finally went to the doctor and they said, you have three months to live. And she ended up dying five weeks later instead. And so that's a huge shock to to me. And being an only child and being very close with my parents and a mesh, you could say almost, um, that it was completely life-changing. And so uh, when you have a big life event like that, you what happened to me was, oh, I could be hit by a bus tomorrow. I get it. Like death is a real thing. Like it's not this imaginary thing that happens. And some part of me woke up and was like, okay, um, shit or get off the pot, Kelly. If you want to be an artist, if you have this thing bubbling inside of you that wants to get out, 
you better start doing it now because who knows how long you have on the planet. And it really did wake me up. It was an enormous wake up call. And that's when I started turning towards wanting to become a storyteller and to start telling my story. Spalding Gray was um, a big hero of mine. Who's Spalding Gray? Spalding Gray is a famous monologist, storyteller, and he had a couple of shows, uh, one of which was called Swimming to Cambodia. He was an actor also, and another one called Monster in a Box. And he would have these amazing solo shows, big theaters. And he was really one of the first people I saw in that genre who um, kind of just unzipped himself on stage and let his whole soul and guts come out and his neuroticism and all that kind of stuff. He was just brilliant at that. So for the last 10 years, authenticity has been something that like everyone's like, you got to be authentic. You got to be authentic. You got to be vulnerable. You got to be vulnerable. You got to put yourself out there. And I know that you've mentioned that your dad struggled when you started putting your story out there because you grew up with him being him and he's in control of that. But suddenly you have your own voice. You have your own story. And this is something that I have always struggled with. It's that I can share my story, but, but my sister didn't ask me to share my, her, you know, our collective story. And I can share my story and I've warned my mom about it. And she's kind of okay with it. But nobody in my life has asked me to share my story, which happens to overlap with some of them. When I share stuff about the company or I'm super vulnerable as a CEO or, or as a founder, None of my team asked me to share these things, right? And so there's this like spillover effect where I'm trying to figure out if you just kind of have the courage to do it, burn some bridges and just put yourself out there, or if there's a more gracious way to go about this. But, but everybody va values the authenticity and vulnerability, but there's just not only so much fear about it, but, but there is some spillover to it. Yeah, it's... It can feel like a very complicated issue. And I think you have to, it's so right. It's a weighing of two different values, full honesty, relationships. Yeah, no, not, not embarrassing and pissing everyone off. <laughs> right. So it's about taking care of relationships and being as truthful as you need to be in order to do what you feel your work is in the world. Um, and some, and some of us are about, telling the truth about ourselves or telling the truth about the world, right? And so with me, was going to do it so that I wasn't making anyone else the perpetrator or the putting the blame on other people. I always took responsibility for whatever experience I had in my life. And so that was one important stance for me when I started doing my storytelling was to make sure that I wasn't coming from a, I need the audience to be on my side and we're going to decide that, you know, my parents or my boyfriend or whoever it was, um, is it, you know, is the enemy in the story and I'm the victim. I don't need the audience to rescue me inside with me. So that was one important stance, I think, as a storyteller is essential. Always make yourself fully responsible for your actions and make yourself the butt of the joke. I mean, like, it's, it's a really great way to learn how to laugh at yourself and see like, oh, here I go again. Oh, I'm dating another crazy guy or whatever it is. And then the other thing was, you know, just really looking at your life and what you're ready for. How much, how much are you ready to, to push that envelope? And so when I first did my, wanted to do my first solo show, which was called Driven to Distraction, which was in 99, um, my dad was so uncomfortable with it that we ended up having to go to my therapist's office to talk about it. And he said to me, look, as an artist, I would never ask you to change a single word. This is your art form. This is your truth. And you need to do this. But I, your father, will not be sitting in the audience because I haven't done all my work on this yet. And I still feel uncomfortable and guilty about this stuff. He didn't say that out loud, but I knew that was going on because he did. <laughs> you you he inferred had a, it through the, the, the he had of sweat. <laughs> he had enormous guilt about all those years. And he even said that, you know, you know, I still have a lot of, you know, I haven't worked through all that stuff yet. I haven't worked on it. He ended up going back to therapy because of that. Um, but he goes, but you know, but know that I love you. And I would never ask you to change a single word. Now I, because of who I am and we had a, a codependent relationship. It was becoming less codependent. Um, I decided, you know what? I don't want to put that pressure on my relationship with my dad. I did three performances of it. 
and I decided I'll just put it on a shelf and I'll, you know, and I went off to grad school and, and loved that and got to seek my authenticity there in a very closed bubble and be seen and heard and got a, a lot of that stuff worked on also. Um, and then years later, when I decided, well, I, you know, I think I am going to write a book about some of this stuff and I was going to do it more with an angle from my spiritual life. And my dad was like, really, you're going to do that? Because didn't you already do a solo show? And I'm like, no, dad, I like did three performances. Like that's not a solo show. Like that's like a, that's like three nights talking to friends and an audience type of a thing. And he was, I could tell he was still uncomfortable, you know, and his generation, I think it's a generational thing too, Mark, because I think his generation um, didn't understand. I mean, we're the Oprah generation, like everyone, Phil Donahue, Oprah, everyone goes on stage and, talk, you know, and talks about their stuff. You know, comedians are much more personal. And my dad's like, you know, people like, you know, maybe artists at the beginning, they talk about their stuff, but then they move on and... And I was like, okay, whatever, dad. I was like, all right. And then I'm like, of course, I go home and I think of the great comeback, which is, I don't think Richard Pryor ever moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, man, from, you know, till the day he died, ripped open his guts and talked about his personal life on stage and his own, right? Being the butt of the joke, right? Kind of a thing. But your dad um, never really talked about personal stuff. Like, zero. zero. Yeah, it was, all, it was all like bits and things like yes. that because he wasn't super vulnerable. His autobiography that he'd had written was sat in his computer. It was ready to be published. The publisher was waiting for it. And he still hadn't published it. We had to publish it posthumously. And so the reason why I then, after he died, went ahead and did a solo show and wrote a book. And now we've got this documentary and Judd and Mike Bonfiglio and the team I had nothing to do with the content of the documentary. They did it all. But why they decided to focus so much on the human story and on the Carlin family in the documentary is because the one thing I said to them is, people need to know my father's human. It's the only reason I shared so much about my life with him on stage and in book form was because I really feel that it is a disservice if we don't make ourselves human, and there was some part of my dad's psychology that that wasn't comfortable for him, you know, but you felt like you knew him. See, that's the trick that my dad had. You felt like you were intimate with him, but you didn't even know he was married or had a kid. No one knew that, right? So it's such an interesting thing. But what, what I, the authenticity piece for me and why that word I think is overused, but why I think it's an important piece for all of us is that it makes us all understand that we're all crazy, broken, fucked up, doing our best, um, making the same mistakes over and over again, having really stupid thoughts about how the world works or how we're supposed to be in it. And that the more we let each other see that, the more we share that I've got this crazy idea in my head about how I think I'm supposed to be or how I think the world is, the more we go, oh, God, thank God I'm not the only one who thinks like that. <laughs> like, I sit in my house thinking I'm alone with this. And when, you know, that's, that's the joy of 12-step programs. You walk into a 12-step program and suddenly everyone in the room is telling your story because you're like, wait a minute, I thought I was alone in this struggle. We are not alone, people. And the more we get that, the more that we are all having very human experiences, which means we are confused, we are lost, we are inspired. Some days we feel like God, other days we feel like we're crazy prisoners, like all of this lives inside of us. And the more we let each other see that and stop just showing up as our roles with each other, or our personas, which are all important things too, of course. But the more we do that, I think the better chance we have as a species on this planet. Because right now we're acting like there's only two types of people in the world and that we have nothing in common with each other. And that we, we, you know, we've completely dehumanized each other when in, the reality is we have 99% of ourselves in common. We have these 1% ideas and policies and, and, and perspectives that are not the same. So I think it's a, if I want to survive with my own mental health, 
I have to share who I am in the world. And part of what I feel is my mission is to give people permission to do that for themselves. I'm, I'm a huge fan of music history. I'll like listen to the music and stuff, but I'm more interested in music history, 60s, 70s, even 80s, the biographies, the memoirs. Um, so I was flipping through this like rare BBC Beatles book where they just, it was a collection of what the Beatles did at the BBC. And in the opening forward, it said, it's this quote, I, I don't remember who quoted it, but it was, the past is a different place. The past is a different place and they do things differently there. And I love that because it's like, we're willing to go on vacation, right? I'm going to go to Spain. And maybe, you know, if you're American, you expect everyone to be American. But most of the world is like, I'm going to go to Spain to experience Spain. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go to Asia to experience the culture and the people and the food and the music. And guess what? They do things differently there. And yet, (laughs) for some reason, in the past, we expect everyone to have... The, the understandings we have, the moral standards that we have, like we right. like like we're going to yeah. cancel people because you know uh, Sean Connery isn't cool because he was in a movie where he he condoned slapping women around. Right, right. Oh, I, I know. The past it's, is it's, a different place. They do things differently there. Absolutely, absolutely, and especially capitalism, especially American culture. There's a a real resistance to being uncomfortable. We would rather, I mean, that's what all consumerism is about. You know, it's, you know, any little bit of discomfort, we have a solution for it, you know, distraction, 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 distraction. And, you know, that's why I called my first solo show driven to distraction was because it's like, what are you distracting yourself with in your life that you feel is more important than actually facing the reality of what you're in, what pickle you've put yourself in relationship wise or what you're putting in your body or maybe, you know, tolerating the system that's around you. Like whatever it is, you know, we can all go. But it takes responsibility, right? Like like, like to do so, you must take responsibility for what you like and your actions and what you don't like. And like that, that's the thing that yes, none of us really want. (laughs) Well, because... We're trained pretty quickly in this culture, um, you know, and slavery is a great example of that, of like, just like, oh, you know, it's, and it's true. I'm one of those people too that believes that we have actually progressed amazingly as a species, right? There's less poor people, there's less this, there's less that, right? There's a lot of less things. And if you don't see the syst- systematically how we, people out of the gate, out of the birth canal are screwed in our country, in our culture, then you're tolerating a fact. You're, you know, you're deciding, well, that's not as important because, well, things are better in, on some level. True. But so it's really about us getting clear as a culture also about what are we tolerating? What, what are we tolerating still? It's still kind of crazy what goes on still, uh, you know, treating women, minorities, poor people, I mean, all uneducated, all of these kind of stuff. But it's the same, it's the same pivot within us. Absolutely. Taking responsibility, accountability. It's and it's basic personal accountability in our own lives, like your your weight thing. I was with you. Um, After the pandemic, I'd gained about 15 pounds, went on a vacation, went to a condo in the desert. The whole thing was mirrored, every side. (laughs) Oh, there's no getting away from that then. I spent four days looking at these 15 pounds on my body, which is not a lot for some people, you know, but for me, I'm a little person. It's a lot for me and disgust happened. And I went back to mindful eating and I went back to this and I, I, you know, I, I knew what to do. I know how to lose weight. I know how to stay, you know, but it is true. But I took, but I took accountability for it. Like, oh, and here's the accountability piece. No one is going to do it for you. Yes. I say that all the time. Like no one is going to save you. I I remind myself of this too. And no one's going to to. come along. No one's going to come along and be like, I think, I think you'd be amazing at this. Let me pluck you out of obscurity. Let me go ahead and pave the road, the golden road for you. Let me go ahead and, 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 and take care of everything for you. Because I've spoken to so many business owners and you probably have as well, where they're like, 
we have so much potential. If someone could just come in and run our business, if someone could just handle sales and marketing, if someone could just... And it's like, yeah, we're all full of potential. Our job yeah. is to like figure all this shit out. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I was stuck in that mindset in my 20s and 30s. That was part of the reason I didn't move forward more quickly, I believe, into my full voice as an artist was because... I thought that someone would discover me. I was, I mean, I, my first marriage, the guy I married thought I was like the most talented, amazing human on earth. I thought, oh, someone finally sees me. He's going to make it all better. Oh God, no. It was like total opposite of what happened. But I did. I had that fantasy. We do have that fantasy of being, you know, Jeannie Garland sitting at the counter at Schwab's and somebody go, hey, hey girl, you got a nice, you got some nice gams. You should be in the pictures. You know? <laughs> And yet no one is going to do it. No one's going to make your money for you. No one's going to write your solo show. No one's going to speak up for you. No one's going to uh, fix your marriage for you. Uh, certainly not your spouse. They're not going to do it for you. Um, you know, all of these things. And so this personal responsibility thing is such an important aspect of being a human being, of being a well-functioning human being. You have to have your own agency. You brought up a little bit earlier the idea of fear. And I had this thought last week. Um, I know that fear motivates all of us. Like every single person. I, I'm a big believer in... Uh, and I say believer because you, it has to almost be a faith uh, at a certain point. But I really like the Enneagram. I like the structure. I like what it does. You can all argue that scientifically personality profiles... And, and Dr. Benjamin Hardy, who I had on the podcast, pretty much breaks down personality profiles are very cultural and you see what you want. But that aside, the Enneagram is all this idea that there's nine basic fears and we tend to have a fear that we move, that we, that we act against. If you're the type of person who really likes control because you just feel like you need control and you don't want to be super vulnerable and you don't, you're worried people are going to weaponize things against you and you just want that control, you're going to act in certain ways to try and maintain control. So... Where I'm going with this is we all have a fear that drives us to do sometimes smart things and sometimes some pretty stupid things. And I'm wondering if whether being truly happy is getting comfortable with that fear, embracing whatever your version of that fear is, and just kind of doing stuff anyway. Yeah. And, and I wonder what you think of that with, with, I mean, knowing that you have a master's degree in, in uh, Jungian, in Jung, Jungian, Jungian psychology. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but, but what do you think about our relationship with fear? And do you think ultimately the, the path to happiness, uh, and maybe your Buddhist or Zen background will also help with this, but, but is it just come down to like, hey, we're all afraid. We're all doing the best we can. And, and the quicker that you could just become friends with your fear, the happier you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a Jungian, we're all about the shadow. So we're all about being in relationship with shadow and fear is the thing that motivates shadow a hundred percent. And that definition of courage is having fear and doing it anyway. Right. So absolutely. We're hardwired for fear because it's about safety and survival ultimately, because the ultimate fear is I will not survive. So all fear comes down oh, to that. Really? I thought the ultimate fear is I, I'm not capable. I, I won't be loved. You know, if I and do this and this and it, this, then I won't be loved. But, but Mark, if you're not loved, what happens then? Oh, you're pushed out of culture. You're pushed out of the community. You, you're you, pushed. Yeah, you're pushed out die. of the fire pit, out of the tribe, uh, and you're out in the jungle, and you're going to die. Huh. So it all comes down to survival for me. And so our little brains, when we're young, we come out, and it's all about survival. I've got these two people and they're, we're, we're, you know, we can't survive on our own. We're mammals. Uh, we need parental. We need a village. We need all of that. We need a lot of growing up before we can survive. Uh, so we make up a lot of rules about how to stay safe and survive. And most of those rules are about the interdynamics of relationships and our obligation to people and who we need to be in order to be loved so that we can be safe. And these are all made by our three, our two, three, four, five, and six-year-old brain, which doesn't even understand some, at times, object permanency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
let alone really real consequences, let alone autonomy, let alone all that kind of stuff. Like we're, we're hard, you know, so we set up this scaffolding of what we think the world is about and how we're going to stay safe in it, which means how we stay loved, make sure we're loved so that we stay safe. And it's all those rules that I think therapy and psychology, but even coaching is helping you dismantle. It's like, you know, the saboteur that comes in that we talk about in coaching is the voice that says, no, you can't do that. Are you crazy? Your work, no, the place is going to burn down. And then you go, so let's just really question this thinking. And you start to question it. And it always comes down to what's your biggest fear? oh, that I'll be left alone and I'll be eating cat food at the age of 90. I mean, like nine out of 10 times, that's the fear. And I'm like, it's interesting how I hear like from every client, this is the ultimate fear. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be stuck out on the streets. I'm going to be unloved. I'm going to be whatever it is. And it's like, if you really walk with a reasonable, rational mind through all of that stuff, you see it's a bunch of bullshit. And so what I do with clients is I say, all right, let's just say the fear is there fine. Okay. But let's do it anyway. And let's be scientists and let's see what happens. And then the person does the thing, which is like, oh, I finally went to the gym and start and signed up or whatever. I'm like, did the walls collapse? Did the earth open up? Tell me, is your husband divorcing you? And is there a meteor coming? No, there's not any of this because we have to see that this ultimate fear that we put this catastrophizing we do is just a fantasy and that if we actually do the thing the 99.99 percent of the other possibilities that could happen have an opportunity to happen for you i love that two things one i just read uh, a few weeks ago this idea of keeping a decision journal and I love this idea, this idea of like any time that you make, I, I guess, a, a bigger decision, something worth, it's not what we're going to eat, but a, a bigger decision, yeah. yep. a commitment, a decision, an investment, something that you feel is risky. Um, keep a journal and then every two or three months go back and just see like, hey, you know, like, mm. what was the decision? What were you worried about? Um, what do you think is going to happen? And how is this going to play out? And then later go back and, and one, realize like, hey, none of that bad stuff actually happens. Yep. Um, it wasn't really a big deal. Or, or you're right. I keep making this series of terrible decisions <laughs> right <laughs> over and over again. So I love I love that idea. I love that, Mark. That's great. I didn't I did I read this in a book. So I can't yeah. even tell you which leadership guru came up with this originally, but but um that's an idea that I definitely want to implement. And then the other thing that that I have to work on because um I have like terrible anxiety and I am afraid of uh pretty much everything, it seems. Like most people don't realize how afraid I am. And my wife, the more we've been together 22 years, the more I share with her, the more she's just like, like, wow, you really overthink everything. I'm so with you, Mark. I'm so and, with you. And I almost don't want to tell her everything I'm afraid of because I think she's going to think I'm a giant. She's going to think I'm a giant pussy. But anyway, it's just like, um, anyway, that aside, um, where was I going with this? I, I lost track in, in, in the story. And your anxiety, your anxiety yeah, and, walked in the room and you lost track. <laughs> but um, because I tend to be like af afraid of, of almost nothing that comes true. Like I just have to keep yep. doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. But part of me uh, a few years ago was like wondering when I would like finally have to stop facing all of these fears. Like, like hey, when, when, when can the work just kind of be done? And yeah. I realized it's never done. It's never, ever, ever done. So uh, as we wrap up the conversation, I'm just wondering for you, with, with all of the ups and downs you've had, getting, getting the first-hand seat of getting to witness your father's rise and fall and rise and fall in his entire life and everyone else that you've worked with, what is the thing that just keeps us going? Because it, it's not that it ever gets easier. We just have to keep going. So what pulls you through? What drives you through? I think the fun thing is that it, changes in one's life and with each decade but i had a i have a wise coach myself who says to me there's kind of two choices every day are you going to live or are you going to die and if you choose to live you're going to put your you're going to kind of jump on the life force train and life force is 
just eternally moving forward, evolving, moving to the next thing. And it doesn't mean that you have to always be quote unquote working on yourself. I think it's really important to have an aspect of a self where you know that no matter where you are in your life, you are enough right now. But even in that enoughness, are you participating or not? And your level of participation on earth can be as simple as eating food today, breathing, that's minimum, (laughs) minimum participation to the biggest leap you want to make, risk, entrepreneurial, creative, emotional, whatever it is. But just being conscious, I'm here and I'm, I'm alive. So this means I'm participating on some level. And then if you choose the other, which is I don't want to participate, you know, that's where depression comes in. I'm an anxiety depression girl. So I flow between these two things, right? You know, and, and it's different for me. Some days I think I, I'm here to conquer the world and change the world and want to be this change maker. And other days I realize that's exhausting. That's too much. What can I do in my small circle to do that today? Um, and which one, but, which version of you is the real you? That's what I always ask myself because I, I, I flip between depression and anxiety as well. I flip between this is the greatest thing in the world to, to like extreme moments of panic. Like I am so good at tricking people that I've tricked myself kind of. You know yeah, I, mean? I think it's all real. In the end, I I think it's really being in choice, though, around it. And I think depression and anxiety are symptoms that keep us from facing, you know, the intolerable in some ways. You know, depression just lets us disappear from it and go to sleep. We become unconscious and anxiety is about managing it. But that's why I love, I practice mindfulness and I've been a practicing Buddhist for 25 years because there's a third way which is you sit with both and realize that it's just all bullshit in the end. We're just here. We're just these amazing conscious minds watching it all that have a lot of big ideas about things. But in the end, isn't it about really just taking care of ourselves, which means then also being in care of the relationships around us and being in care of our environment with an open heart and seeing people for who they are and valuing every moment. I think being in awe and wonder of just being alive is really an antidote for all of that stuff. If you let yourself really be in awe about this amazing thing that we're in, I mean, look at this. We made spoons. This is amazing. Like really in awe of all of it. Then all of this other stuff, needing courage, what do I do? Who am I? It doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter because when you're in awe, you are being in full relationship with everything, including yourself, including the people around you, including objects, including the environment. And I think that, like for me, if there's an antidote for this crazy mind we have, this executive function mind, which wants to control and make and do, which are all amazing things. I I think this is why religion, we don't have religion anymore. And I think what's happened in our culture because of that is we don't have a relationship with awe and wonder. So I think some practice where you can be in relationship with awe and wonder helps to balance the constructed life that we've got around us here in society and the compromises we have to make with ourselves and the internal voices and the psychology of it all. I think it's an important piece that humans are hardwired for and create a sense of connection to everything and and create a sense of calm and ease in our bodies that just make everything better and move smoother in the world. And I think once we figure this out, once we're really post indoctrinated religion and let spirituality be a path to this and not some sort of like, oh, you're weak or stupid because you need to talk to the universe. You know, the universe is just the imagination. Everything that is unconscious in our mind, which is about 99% of our, of our experience, is, is what we call God, is what we call the mystery, is what we call the universe. Um, it's where all potential and creativity comes from. And 
once we get that we can actually have a relationship with that and know that, I think life gets a lot more interesting. And this is why I love Jungian depth psychology, because it is the study of the unconscious. It is the study of the deep imagination. That is the mystery of life. That's the awe. You know, it's like, ah, how did this all come to be? I don't know, but oh my God, this is wonderful. So there's something in that that helps one really walk and hold the tension of those opposites. In, in, a, in a book written in the 60s, uh, uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, the author introduces this idea that, that's been grabbed by many people of this like one consciousness, like this one thing, this one idea, every idea that's ever existed has already existed. And when something comes to you, wherever that may come from, it's this idea that it's like, it's a gift to you and it's been pulled out of, I, I don't know if I really understand <laughs> in the way I'm asking the question, but what you just described reminded me of that. Do you think that, that there's any truth to that? Do you understand what I'm even asking? Yeah, I do. I do. And um, he stands on the shoulders of Freud and Jung. I mean, these were the two men who Freud said, there's this thing called the unconscious. And he saw it as a pathological neurotic thing. And Jung came along and said, yeah, there's this thing called the unconscious. It's a personal one, but there's also this collective unconscious. And he called it the self with a capital S. And it is this thing that it's like, does everything lives in pure potential somewhere? Everything ultimately is an idea first. This was an idea first. A chair was an idea first. And then someone would go, oh, we could make things to sit on. And then the human mind was like, I'm going to figure out how to do that. Yay, that's the conscious mind doing that. But it, it's all out there. You know, you're an entrepreneur. You understand the importance of mindset in stepping out into the world to, to, to create things and make things. 90% of the time, when I do stuff like that, it's a huge leap of faith in like, I don't know what's happening, but I know that this brain here does, is, doesn't have the freaking answers and doesn't know everything because if it did, I'd go back to bed because that's all, that's all I can handle. There is a trust. There is a leaning into something that is bigger than my ego consciousness. I don't know what you want to call that. Science doesn't have a word for it yet. We don't know what it is. Jung called it the personal and the collective unconscious. That's what we call it. Uh, depth psychologists also call it like the deep imagination or something like that. It's where everything lives in pure potential. Is there a place where like the, every idea is floating around? Like, I don't, I think it's like quantum physics. Like you can't even wrap your head around what it possibly could be. I think the only way we can be in relationship with it is to just be in relationship with it. It's the ego mind that wants it to be a certain shape with a certain name and put a label on it. Let's get data. And hopefully someday we'll have instruments where we'll be able to get data on it. But the data that I use is the data of experimentation in my life. And I know that when I am in relationship and trusting something bigger than my ego mind, and they do this in 12 step two, they're like, you don't have to call it God. You can call it the doorknob. We don't care. But it's that there's something bigger than this thing called Kelly and all of her big ideas about how the world should be and how life is. When I'm in relationship with that and let it be as real to me as science and rationality and all these other things, my life really gets interesting and goes places and things happen. And those leaps we talked about, these fear leaps, these, these leaps of into faith and into things and trying things out and decision trees and making and all that stuff, that happens at a much more accelerated rate when I know that I don't got all the answers and I'm going to lean in with an intuition or an idea and move towards something and I'm either going to find out right away, yes or no, yes or no. It's always a, it's always a leap, ask what's needed now. Oh, what's here? Oh, okay. This worked out. Leap. Ask what's needed now. And the leaping is a leap of faith into the unknown. So there is something unknown. It's just the unknown is what we don't know. Thank you so much for joining me. I wanted to quickly ask you about uh, Women on the Verge. Uh, can you tell me what yes. that is? So Women on the Verge is a year-long program that I've created. It helps... Uh, it was initially built just for women to really do that leap in midlife where maybe you've come to, uh, your kids are gone now, 
Um, you've been in a career for 25 years and it's not doing it anymore. You've always been a creative. You've never let your creative out. Whatever it is, you're at a point in your life where you're like, hmm, yeah, everything's kind of, I did it all or everything and it's it's not what I want. It's not working for me. Or like, I know I need to transfer. I need to transform some things. I know I need you know to what? shed some things. My wife and I had this moment a few years ago where it was like, is this all that, like, this yes. is it? Like, like yes. this, okay, so now I, this is what the next 10 or 20 years is, is just more of this. And it was like, right. oh, what a terrible feeling. <laughs> and, and there is, I mean, this is why the midlife crisis happens, right? And, and Carl Jung talked a lot about this, which is like the first half of life is kind of the life of the ego. You become autonomous, you have agency, you go out, you make things in the world, you make it happen, you participate in society and we get all the, we do it all. And then at some point, it's a meaning crisis. You know, it's the Peggy Lee song, is this all there is, you know? Um, And it's that moment. And I originally did it just for women because um, I had reached that moment. And there's something called the heroine's journey that we study in depth psychology. And for women, especially because women's, menu of roles when they are born are much shorter than men's, even if you're born in 2022. Uh, we've been, we picked from a much more limited option. And what happens is there's so much more for us to give and so much more for us to, to express, right? So I wanted to give that for women. Next year, it's really shifting and it's going to be much more of a co-ed space. Uh, and I do that through uh, a, a a course that I have called True North, which is co-ed and it starts in the new year. Um, But really it's, for me, this work is that interior work that needs to happen. And it's about helping you get authentic agency. So it's about aligning your authenticity with your actions. Pretty much everything we talked about today. (laughs) I love it. I love the name too, because as a Canadian, True North, strong and free, it's like, Right there in our in our national anthem. So it's that uh, inner GPS. That's the way I see the true north, right? It's that little <laughs> arrow that's always going, Oh, this is my life path. This works for me. This is the thing I'm here to express. The final question I have for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Oh Christ. <laughs> <laughs> A- Amen. <laughs> we do, you we know, do that little thing. <laughs> Well, I'm only going to speak for me, not in some big global way, because that's where I source everything from. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is if I can be grateful and present in the moment for whatever is going on, then I have a chance. I have a chance to get out of my own way. I have a chance to connect authentically with others. I have a chance to do some work in the world that fulfills me deeply and hopefully has a positive impact on the culture and and others. So there's something about starting very, very small and within myself. And it's why I do mindfulness meditation because it's the first moment is just acknowledging that I'm breathing. (laughs) 